Okay, so this picks up where we left off with the previous video. Um, after the initial setup, you gotta lay out details so you create a big uh, grid that you can work with. Um, so in this situation, there are some engaged columns that are, um, they don't stick out in depth in any way, but they create a visual pattern on this wall. So um, I'm just kind of roughly estimating where they would go on either side of the building. Um, and uh, it'll probably look a little bit distorted um, because of the way it's applied. It's a rough estimate, not exactly measured perfectly. Um, you may want to measure and get everything correct. But as long as you're adhering to the rules and you follow a sense of internal consistency, it should be okay. Um, and then uh, with the engaged columns, you kind of just estimate where they're going to go, make sure that uh, whichever side is appears bigger is actually slightly bigger on the paper, and go from there. Um, you can use the corner-to-corner uh, -corner X method to find the visual center of any given plane. So there are three columns on each side that I'm going to be focusing on. And uh, using this method, I can find the center of the middle column. And then I do that on both sides, back to back, and find a relationship of how this is all going to go. So now that I found the center, what I need to do is to use the X method again, and I can actually find um, another part of this column. So now I found the uh, center and the outside of the left column, and then I go and do that again on the right side. And I found the center and the outside of the middle column as well. <coughs> so once you have that done, you can um, uh, estimate where the inside of the column is going to go because you know that the inside half is going to be bigger than the outside half. And then you can estimate the size of the very far outer column based on that. So now you have a progression of three columns going back in space. You know, after that, you don't necessarily need a ruler for a whole lot of things because you have this grid that you can base all of your line work off of. So you can then begin to kind of freehand everything else. Um, the rest of the details will go in a lot faster once you have this kind of grid put down. So I have a couple of windows here that I'm going to knock in, and I'm going to start with just the outline of the windows so that I know exactly where they're going to go. And I can knock in all four windows two on either side. I notice right now that I'm just, that initial grid that I put down, I'm just following that initial grid because um, it makes more sense to do that. Um, and this is where the creativity comes in. So this is my first deviation from what I'm actually seeing um, outside. So rather than measure and create these windows um, along this uh, along their actual relationship to the wall, I'm making them adhere to the grid that I've created in eight parts. So that's just going to make it easier for me to apply all of the rules of perspective because I have these lines as a basis. So now I can start including details of the windows. They all have uh, a framework in them, and so I can uh, repeat the framework on both sides and through all the windows. And you'll notice that there are only um, three types of lines in most perspective drawings. In one point perspective, you have horizontal lines, vertical lines, and you have lines that recede to the vanishing point. In two point perspective, you have three types of lines. You have vertical lines, you don't have any horizontal lines, but you have lines that recede to the right vanishing point and lines that recede to the left vanishing point. So if you find yourself attempting to put a horizontal in a two-point perspective drawing, something's probably wrong. You have to ask yourself, is it vertical? If so, it stays vertical. And is it diagonal? And if it's diagonal, which vanishing point does it go to? Those are the ways that you can kind of check yourself. 
So everything within all these small details, just everything has to go back to the vanishing point. So there are a lot of architectural details in this building. There are these little um, diamond things. And I can continue to use the X um, corner to corner method and subdivide these um, rectangles to find the visual center so that I know exactly where these little diamond shapes should go. And once I get once I get the hang of doing this once, then it becomes easier to do the rest of them. I can give them a little bit of line weight uh, rather than adding any value, just to be sure that um, there's this sense of, of shadow going in with these little diamonds. So now that I have these diamonds done, I can go on and continue to put more in. The X subdivision uh, method works really great. You'll find yourself using that a lot, um, especially when you get into structure and creating um, complicated objects out of boxes and cutting things out of boxes. You'll need to be able to find the, the center of any plane. Incidentally, that works um, in uh, construction and anytime you're doing any kind of woodworking you can measure corner to corner and find the center of something so I'm putting a little bit of tone down on these diamonds because I know that they are gonna have some tone I don't know their exact value yet but I'm just gonna put it there as a reminder uh, for myself for later so this is just a the necessary drudgery of doing a perspective drawing is that you're going to repeat a lot of details. Um, later on in the next video, we will cover some ideas of doing uh, things with value and, and making the value a little bit more efficient and creating patterns and textures. Because you don't want to sit here and draw every brick in a brick building. That's just not feasible time-wise. So every time these diamonds repeat, you just do the same little process, create a little diamond, and uh, you'll notice that the as the diamonds get smaller, the value I'm putting on them gets a little bit more faint and less distinct. Um, and that's to kind of create a sense of atmospheric perspective as well as linear perspective. Atmospheric perspective is the idea that there's atmosphere, um, you know, air between what's closest to you and what's furthest from you. And you can use that in linear perspective as well. We'll focus on that uh, more directly within a landscape drawing later, but it's something to keep in mind even in perspective because those two things are very closely related. So I would advise you to um, skip around the drawing a little bit so you don't get over overly focused on one area. Um, you can go in a very rigid pattern where you can kind of do different details at different times um, and come back to stuff as long as you have that initial setup with all your um, with all your divisions done correctly, everything else should fall into place pretty readily. So I noticed that there are windows above the low registers of windows, and they have a slightly different detail to them. They have a little concrete border on the top of the bottom, and then they do have their their framework as well. They're not as wide as the as the windows on the bottom, so there's an opportunity to create some interest to the building. And rather than go with complete accuracy, I've just skipped a register and taken up two little registers for the height of the window. So part of drawing is figuring out what to include and what to exclude. If you remember the, the picture of this building, there's a huge tree in the way, some poles, some columns, all kinds of stuff. And I've eliminated that to get to the building itself because the building itself is where the bulk of the perspective work is going, so I don't want to get distracted by drawing a tree in the foreground that kind of overlaps all my hard work. So, um, you know, you can do those sorts of things, but if, if they're in the super foreground, um, it can be a little bit distracting having those included in the actual drawing itself. And, you know, one of the other things, too, is once you... Once you your goal is to internalize this so that you don't have to think about it very hard. 
Um, and one of the things that happens is you can kind of stop using a ruler, you know where your vanishing points are, um, and you can just draw. Um, you can estimate uh, relationships and proportions, and this can go really, really quickly. Um, within an hour, say, you could get a whole building drawn on an 18 by 24 piece of paper with full value. Um, but it takes a while to get there, so you have to do the process over and over again, uh, practice in your sketchbooks, and be sure to uh, get a handle on this. This is the simplest and most logical way to create depth. Um, and essentially what we're doing in drawing is just creating depth. You notice here in this section, there's a little brick pattern that I'm trying to create. And so what I've done is I've created the long receiving lines first, and then I can very quickly subdivide these little um, checkerboard brick patterns, and then go back and put a little loose tone on them. I'm not even being completely accurate with the tone, um, or really very precise about where it is, and yet it still creates the pattern, and it's still going to serve uh, in terms of creating some depth to the drawing. So, if you find yourself getting bored and frustrated with the rigidity of perspective, you know, remember that you can be a little bit loose as long as that understructure is there. So that's one of the things that you want to be careful of is that you take sets of patterns like this together. If you take each individual little uh, brick and draw each individual little brick in this pattern, uh, you're going to get bogged down time-wise. But if you draw the whole pattern together, it's going to go really quickly. And you'll notice here that I had forgotten or just put off doing all of these little diamonds. But, you know, you have to come back to them at some point. And that's totally fine. You, know, you don't have to do all of this all in the same order. You can kind of go left to right, putting a lot of pattern in and making the right side match the left side. Or you can go by category. You can do all the windows together. You can do all the diamonds together. Um, anything that you, any any approach that you want is totally valid as long as you follow the rules and keep everything in proportion. You notice that if you lay out the grid, then you can um, put some tone down really quickly. And I didn't really count the number of divisions here. I'm just kind of going by feel. And here, I didn't even mark out the vertical lines on it. I'm just putting in the tone very directly and very faintly so that it seems like there's a little bit of extra depth there. You know, any little detail that you can see on the building is good fodder for developing your drawing. Um, there are these extra little off-color bricks in there, um, one on each side of these little windows. So I'm going to add that. And then the original building had that same brick pattern between the diamonds, but I'm going to deviate from that and use a different pattern just to create a little bit more interest. Um, it makes sense to me to kind of use the world as a reference uh, for to get a good drawing because ultimately no one cares about where you were sitting you know, people that look at your pieces they care about the piece itself so you can deviate um, as much or as little as you want but the idea here is that you're that you're letting reality be your guide um, you're paying attention to what you see um, so it's kind of it's kind of a a little bit of gray area and the creativity comes from basically inclusion and omission and the application of these principles. And again, if you've forgotten something in, in the process, you can add it right back in and then you've completed your uh, detail setup. <coughs> 